Okay, so it's 10.35. I think people had enough time to find where we are. So welcome everybody uh, to this, perhaps it's the first, I don't know, is the first workshop in this uh, FAP 16 event. Uh, my name is Ivan Sanchez Milara. I am from uh, uh, Fab Lab Oulu and University of Oulu. And today I will lead this uh, workshop which title is Embedding Digital Fabrication into, into Higher Education. So there has been a lot of discussion uh, in the community. Uh, there is a lot of uh, research work going on, on on how to integrate digital fabrication into uh, comprehensive education, primary and secondary education. So there is a lot of work going on. Actually, we are doing also in all work on, on, on this regard, but there is not that much uh, information or there is not that much research on, on how digital fabrication can be en embedded or can be integrated into higher education, either university or vo vocational education. The idea of this workshop is to provide some kind of first impressions, uh, first uh, ideas on uh, on how this can be done with examples on, on, on different uh, fab labs, different institutions that have succeed or are starting to integrate in digital fabrication into, into higher education. To that end, uh, well, this is the, the, the agenda for the, for the workshop today. Uh, I will start with a short, uh, presentation on the network that uh, we have built around one year ago and we are collaborating with in order to share uh, best practice on how to integrate uh, data fabrication into higher education. We are going to present uh, three different successful use cases from three different universities in Europe. And then uh, we are going to have uh, panel discussions uh, with members of these three universities in where we are going to uh, discuss on best practice challenge and, and so on. After that, I will give uh, around 15 minutes for the audience to ask their own questions. We can have a, a, a discussion. Uh, you can perhaps ask questions or if you have had some experience, you can comment also on your experience. And I would like to finish with a, a kind of uh, wrapping up and creating a few conclusions. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I'm not going to be alone in this. Actually, I'm just going to facilitate the discussion, but the workshop is going to be, or the people who is going to talk, who is going to present their ideas are going to be uh, Gianni Lioja from uh, University of Oulu and FabLab Oulu. We will have time later for, for further presentations, okay? So just very quickly. Gianni Lioja, FabLab Oulu, University of Oulu. Lou Hannes from AgriLab, uh, Uni La Salle in France. And then also Jose Moura from Nova School of Science and Technology in Portugal. Hello, Luke, Jose. And Yanni. Hello. So before going to the uh, presentations, before going to the uh, different use cases, I would like to give a short introduction on, on why this workshop and uh, why did we start with this uh, community around, I don't remember the exact dates, but it was around one year ago. So, uh, as all of you know, uh, most of the uh, or most of the fabulous that are participating in this in this event, uh, they have previously participated in Fab Academy, or or are currently teaching Fab, Fab Academy in their in their uh, in their premises, and. Uh, FAP Academy in the end is an introduction, a, a very comprehensive introduction to digital fabrication. And many um, institutions, many higher education institutions have seen that the content of this um, uh, FAP Academy could be uh, of the interest of their own students. So there is uh, a strong effort in some of these institutions in order to accredit 
in order to uh, somehow recognize the knowledge that the, the, the students can get from a FAP Academy and use it into their own um, plans, into their own um, uh, education plans. Uh, there is one important thing here. Actually, FAP Academy uh, doesn't provide, let's say, a uh, degree from any institution. So basically, FAP Academy, the only thing that this pro provide is, is, is ensuring that the students who graduate in FAP Academy has uh, the minimum set of knowledge, the minimum set of knowledge required to, to, to uh, to get this uh, FAP Academy certificate, but there is no an institution behind that. So, uh, as I mentioned before, different universities all around the world, perhaps is more strong the efforts in, in Europe, but, but there are e e universities from all, all, all around the world are trying to bring this knowledge into the, the degree programs. And since each university is different, each university is bringing this accreditation in different ways. So here you have a, a table of the universities uh, that are right now accrediting FAP Academy. Actually, you can get this table from a FAP Academy website. Uh, and you can see there how uh, this uh, accreditation is done. There are, especially in Europe, the universities in, in Europe, they are uh, providing some ECTS. So ECTS for all who are not uh, familiar with this is a kind of uh, um, credit system all around Europe in which uh, uh, one credit represents around 27 hours of uh, a student work. And then each degree program in, uh, in the European universities, they have a set of uh, ECTS. If I remember correctly, usually master degree program uh, usually have between 120 and 180 uh, ECTS. So these European universities, they are accrediting this uh, FAP Academy using this ECTS, depending on the university. This is something that, that we have been discussing also in the network. This depends on the country, depends on the university. The number of ECTS is, is slightly different, but then you can see that uh, there are some other uh, ways of, of uh, defining this uh, accreditation. For example, in the case of Texas of Peru, they have a specialization diploma. Um, also, a specialization in, in, in Fab Lab Fasens in, in, in Brazil. Um, and then also, well, there are thinking, for example, we'll have here, I think that we have someone from Vigyan, Asram. I think that we have them between the audience, so perhaps they can comment later in the discussion time, how are they planning to do this, uh, this accreditation? So as you see, there are a lot of universities that are uh, bringing somehow FAP Academy into their degree programs. They are integrating FAP, FAP Academy into higher education. Um, so, Jani uh, Lioya here in the University of Oulu, uh, he wrote in 2019 a paper, uh, Academic Recognition of FAP Academy, that was presented in Foreign Europe uh, uh, 2019, where uh, he, well, I was also co author in there, but it was mainly him. Uh, he, uh, and he can tell later more about this, okay? So he um, put in a paper, uh, formalized all these efforts. So uh, we uh, calculate uh, how many hours each one of our students in FAP Academy was dedicating to this. We compare uh, this um, uh, FAP Academy with other courses in, in our degree programs. And then uh, we estimated the uh, number of uh, credits that FAP Academy should have. And then we propose, we create a proposal on, on how we can create a kind of uh, degree program or how we can uh, convert FAP Academy into a, a set of courses, of university courses 
uh, and in that way we facilitate the recognition of these credits. Actually, Jan is going to talk a little bit more. But but this this paper was of a strong interest of the community, and uh, after the uh, FAP X uh, twenty twenty, um, there was a strong interest on creating a, um, a working group on this accreditation. So the idea of this uh, collaboration network, uh, it was mainly for, or when we started, we started mainly with European partners, but we are open to, to partners from all our, around the world. And the idea of this collaboration network, it was to share best practice on how digital fabrication have been integrated. So what are the challenges, uh, how we have, done it and then also provide support to people uh, or to other partners who are interested in 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 bringing this digital fabrication into higher education we started with fab academy but it's not completely tied to fab academy so now the network is a little bit more broader and and uh, the goal of the network is is uh, provide support, provide help, and share the best practice between people into higher education, not that, that, that want to have uh, digital fabrication, they want to have their fab lab uh, working into, into their degree programs. Actually, we have uh, in, in, uh, in GitLab, uh, we, have, we are uploading some information there. I can open, if, if you want to participate, I can, uh, give you later some information on, on how you can join. We are having um, meetings every month since uh, I guess it was September, October 2020, where we are uh, presenting the different partners. Uh, we are discussing on the on the practice uh, and we are creating some documentation. And on this documentation, we are writing a white paper that is an ongoing work. Uh, where the different uh, different partners are presenting their experience there. Actually, we have in Google Drive, uh, we are planning to move it to this uh, GitLab repository. So if you are interested to contribute to this, just let us know and you can, you can be part of, of this white paper writing. Then uh, we, we, we think that it, it would be nice if we can strengthen this collaboration by um, um, visiting other fab labs, try to visit and learn from, from other fab labs, how are they doing this integration? And to that end, we are trying to get some funding. Uh, since the, most of the partners are Euro European partners, uh, we are trying to apply uh, Erasmus Plus uh, funding in order to, to strengthen a stagnant this network. So the idea would be at some point to hopefully next year or in two years time to have some exchange of both students and instructors from different institutions uh, all, all around Europe. And it helps to learn how this, uh, how can we integrate digital fabrication in, 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 in higher education, which are the best practice, which are the challenges as, as we, we are going to have in the, in the panel discussion, challenges sometimes are common, sometimes depends a lot on the, on the country or the institution that hosts the, uh, the Fab Lab, and which are the ways of uh, collaboration that we can have between Fab Labs and, um, and uh, higher education institutions when the Fab Lab is not part of this higher education institution. There is something that we have been discussing also in long term. Uh, I don't know if we are going to achieve this at some point, but one of the ideas is uh, to create a European master program in digital fabrication based on the content of FAP Academy. But this, uh, it's, uh, I think that this is very challenging because in spite of um, being in Europe and having uh, this uh, ECTS credit system, in the end each country is different, it's, institution is different. So um, I don't know if we are going to achieve this uh, European master program in digital fabrication, but it's something that we have in mind and that perhaps we are going to try if people is interested. 
Okay, so this is broadly a uh, presentation on the idea of the of the network, how why we created the network, and then uh, let's move to the uh, presentations. So we are going to have three presenters. We are going to have Luke from AgriLab, uh, Uni Lasalle in France. We are going to have Jose Moura from Nova School of Science and Technology in Lisbon, Portugal and Gianni Lioya from University of Oulu. So look, do you want to take the lead now? Uh, okay, to... yeah, okay. I, I think I was second, but that, that's okay for me. Uh, so I, I don't have a, a PowerPoint because I don't really like PowerPoint. So that's uh, an easy answer. And um, I have several seats behind me be because we are also some kind of hub for uh, Fab16. And uh, I have Jason next to me uh, from Brussels. Um, and we will probably have uh, other people that need to drive uh, four or five hours to arrive here. So they are not yet here. Um, so I'm uh, Luc and us, and we are in uh, AgriLab. Um, I can share my screen and show, a, okay. The, Animator needs to give me the screen sharing. Um, otherwise, I can talk. Yeah. So we are um, uh, higher education in France, and um, we are not so called a university. We are um, what's called an engineering school, and uh, that depends. Sorry, look. You should be able to share now. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Great. So do you see my screen? Yeah, you should see, uh, but at first I will continue. So um, we are an engineering school, so that's some kind of higher education in France. And uh, it depends on what's called the uh, uh, engineering title education. So you need to respect uh, a lot of rules to be um, considered as a, engineering school and we have a lot of discussion to include uh, the Fab Academy program to be recognized as uh, six months of uh, engineering study and we succeed. So uh, um, engineering student, students can uh, participate in Fab Academy for six months and that's recognized as part of their uh, education program. So, we are called AgriLab, and as you can guess, it's related to agriculture. So this is the um, huge building of AgriLab, and here is a farm, and all around us are uh, farm fields where we can experiment. And you don't see here on the on the left there is the rest of uh, the campus. Um, Unilasal is um, in real several engineering school. So we are the Bove part where we have uh, three different kind of study, uh, agriculture, um, something related to food and geology. But we have also different campus where they can learn uh, really different stuff. And all those students have access to AgriLab, and uh, since la uh, since last year, they can uh, be part of the Fab Academy program for the last year of engineering uh, study. So as uh, now that's not the one. Yeah, as uh, Ivan mentioned, um, we give we we are in the table, and so we give also. Uh, 30 ETS, so that's almost uh, six months of a, a master program. Um, so students can come and learn. How do we um, do the lessons in a certain way? We just uh, do the, um, the Fab Academy uh, schedule, so this kind of schedule. But we add a lot of um, workshop that we do ourselves. Like um, if I take the March week, like it will be um, electronics, computer, and all that. We have a, a schedule uh, for AgriLab, 
And so we propose uh, several workshops and uh, uh, Fab Academy students can participate to them. So they, they will learn how to use the, the machine and that will help them to do the, the program. But also those, um, those workshops are open to anyone in AgriLab. So over students that- doesn't, ah, so Sorry, yeah. Other students that are um, that have access to AgriLab can uh, participate in those workshops. Um, yeah, so that's a part of it. Um, I say that, yeah. We we are um, really interested to to give those lessons to engineering students because in agriculture. Um, I think it's a huge need. So th the goal is not to learn digital fabrication for itself, but <coughs> to be able to build prototype to, to be used in agriculture. That's really one of the goals because we, we discover that um, um, there are a lot of fields that can be uh, explored. So this is an example of uh, a small robot that, that can move around and um, students in agriculture don't have um, a, a lot of knowledge in uh, electronics and so and also in designing and prototyping so with the father uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they can um, learn all the skills during uh, six months and the idea is that at the end they, they can really build some kind of uh, prototype. So for now, we only give access to the um, this Fab Academy program to the fifth year. So it's a bit sad because they will have Fab Academy at the end of their uh, master degree, and then they finish and that's it. So we, we are trying to give access to uh, the third year students. So they will have all the um, uh, prototyping uh, knowledge and then they can use them to really build prototype uh, inside our place and uh, work further. Um, so that's a bit how we do the work in, uh, in uh, AgriLab. Uh, we are also are a part of um, some kind of European networks. So that's why I have uh, students from ULB today. We have also people from the WAC and from uh, Camp Linford. So that's also a good way to work uh, really together. And uh, the idea of particip participating in this kind of network is also to have um, a different uh, point of view on how to teach, um, how to work together. So we try during uh, this year to share some uh, workshop with um, other people of this network. Um, that, that was really uh, interesting and a great way of learning for instructor, but also for students. Um, and um, yeah. That's really one thing we, we, we need to look further in, in this group. And I think really, as Ivan said, that um, to, to be able to visit each other place, we, we will uh, learn and discover really more because uh, of course, uh, remote workshop are cool, uh, but to be in the place uh, to see how, um, instructor manage students how uh, as Yanni explained before some fab lab are working in a way by themselves with a user that are uh, enabled to to manage themselves it's really a great way of improving uh, the way we are working here because nowadays we really need to um, make clear schedule for the student to, to tell them how to do all the workshop and to to really manage them. And we hope that we, we can improve that system by uh, uh, exchanging knowledge with uh, overlaps. I think I don't really watch the time. 
And I, I think I, I prefer to let time for uh, interaction and question and answer. Yeah, uh, thank Luke. Only one, one question. What is your relation with the different universities that are participating? What kind of agreement do you have with them? Oh, they, they are part of our group, so it, it's not really... So it's the same kind of... Uh, yeah, I, I have only a discussion with um, a director of some program, uh, to, to be sure, because those are um, older universities that come in a group. So... Um, certain time they need more um, li like for the 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 end of the um, uh, fab academy some want but it's really details like some want a, a pdf with all the stuff and i have to explain okay but it's a website and uh, a video in a pdf doesn't make sense but so so it's really discussion of really small details but they recognize the six months it's agreed uh, on the higher level um and and for that yeah the the direction was really comprehensive uh with us uh they really understand and i, I can give a, a clue of why it was easy uh that's because the the husband of uh the highest uh, direction participate in the fab academy program two years ago so I, I don't need to to explain that much that it was useful and we 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 do create workshop and great exchange with overlaps. Thank you, Luke. I think we are going to have a little bit more time later for discussion and compare the different the different approaches. Now, if I share my screen again. Yeah, we can move to Jose Moura from Nova School of Science and Technology, Lisbon. I have your presentation here, Jose, so I guess. Thank you very much. Going to present. So stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for this kind of opportunity to share uh, some of the experience uh, going on on the FCT Fab Lab. I'll go very briefly uh, to give you an idea, the integration of the FCT Fab Lab. We are in the new University of Lisbon, the NOVA, and we are a school of engineering, uh, science and technology. Uh, so I'll try to give you uh, this short background and then a few examples how we have been thinking and integrating the work of the Fab Lab in the education. So even if you give me the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, very general. So as of all your Fab Labs, the mission is to facilitate and promote a wider range of knowledge resources. And uh, we like to have, uh, as you know, Fab Labs are supposed to be a friendly space where people can exchange ideas and uh, stimulate the work that is going on. And since we are in the campus, a science and technology campus, uh, our publics are uh, the students. We have 8,000 students in the campus with different engineerings. And uh, we also try to attract the teachers and researchers, so they are the academics. But we are quite open to the general public and to the community. So we always aim to, to attain the campus, but also the, the community. And we launch a few programs of digital literacy programs and projects where we are involved. Uh, these uh, are supposed to develop skills for ori uh, orientated to problem solving. And what is quite unique in this case, and I'll go very briefly, the FCT Fab Lab is in, was launched by the library, which I'm, I'm a professor at university, but also I'm director of the, li of the library. So next slide, uh, very briefly, why sometimes people ask why, why a Fab Lab in a, promoted by a library in the campus? Uh, as you know, libraries have been all time uh, forefront providers of access to new technologies. Libraries are very democratic spaces, so they, are, they have a tradition of collaborations and learning new technologies, and they are very accessible, accessible to uh, everybody. And uh, digital fabrication is now recognized as a powerful tool of teaching in STEAM. I like very much not STEM, but STEAM, because I like to bring the hearts also to, to this problem. So with this very general background, uh, where we are sitting uh, in a campus, the next slide will give you uh, um, also an idea of the interactions and the publics we have. Actually, the infrastructure support teaching and research to a very wide range of disciplines. We, we managed to attract a lot of engineering and biomedicine, because these are the most 
uh, concentrated in the campus, but we have people from environment, from arts, from uh, education, architecture, even museums, archaeology, they, they, they came to use the Fab Lab. And we are open to academics, as I told you, but also to artists, creatives, designers, entrepreneurs, and very important to general public. We like that people feel uh, that this is a space where they can promote their ideas. And so we are very open to the general community. So in the next slide, uh, I will give you uh, just uh, some thoughts uh, about education, how to get there. And I choose five examples, uh, so we can discuss much more, but these are five examples I took. So the next slide will give you an idea. So the first is workshops. This has been very important. Uh, we have been providing uh, on the five pillars and others knowledge uh, grounds, uh, workshops. Uh, these uh, generally they are open to the to the public, we, we announced workshops and people inscribe for the workshops. In general, we have six to eight workshops per month. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, in the last year, and as you know, due to the pandemic, we could not do that presential. So most of them were online. But th that makes us think a little bit about this because we attract more people because it's online. In a certain way, people. Uh, they are not in the campus, but bring they came and they are very interested in the workshops, and um, and also we have some of the workshops are tailor made for for the departments. If uh, someone's uh, department want to have something special, we do a tailor made workshop, and uh, we launch also something we call uh, Fab Yourself, and this is a uh, special workshops where they have uh, three sessions of tutorials, but they receive at home a kit. And they kind to build up with the kit they receive. They kind to build up kind of a sensor of a, a small engine, something they they can provide. And then they have tutorials uh, how to accomplish and realize the job they are proposed to do. And uh, during this pandemic times, I don't mention this, but the Fab Lab was very involved also in in uh, doing. Uh, uh, signaling for the buildings, uh, you know, arrows and how to people move around and to do masks and things like that. So the Fab Lab is also very involved in these pandemic times. Next slide will give you um, uh, another impression. And this is the Fab Academy, as Ivan was mentioning already. Uh, we have been involving uh, since, since uh, 2016 in the Fab Academy. You know very well the Fab Academy is a world a worldwide operation uh, involves a lot of students per year. And this is an intensive program with 16 weeks. And uh, uh, we, we train people uh, in the five pillars and more uh, of, of uh, the Fab Lab knowledge. And uh, in the, our case, uh, the, the, the Fab Academy, uh, people receive a diploma from the Fab Academy, but we managed to have also a double certificate. And this is through the Scientific Council. We provide people with a diploma of a specialized course and gives you 16 SCTS. We are discussing how we do uh, these different things. But in our case, we, the students are provided with 16 SCTS. So uh, with this idea, even next slide, uh, we try to launch a further step looking to higher education. And so our model, as I was explaining, the students have a double certificate. They got 16 CTS. And we thought they could use this, uh, as even already mentioned, through master or a PhD program. And what we are discussing with departments, actually, we are very lucky because we have 16 engineering departments in the campus. And so they are kind of they acknowledge a little uh, what is going on on the FAB. So we have been discussing with them. Uh, the next slide. Uh, this uh, is still ongoing. We have not yet, but we try to use the the idea of, of having a FAB lab in the university campus and engineering school. And we try to discuss with them a doctoral program on digital fabrication. So this involves a four-year program, 240 uh, ECTS. And the objective uh, is very clear, is to provide students advanced training in the field of digital fabrication. And the students are uh, welcome into a higher uh, uh, scientific qualified environment in uh, areas of engineering. And uh, we foresee that this could have a very large professional uh, possibilities and routes. 
and uh, this is uh, undergoing. So we have not yet uh, um, uh, on, on, on ongoing, but we hope that very soon we are discussing departments and we have this digital program uh, for a PhD. So next two slides, and I'll be finishing. The next two slides is giving you the idea that we are not looking also to the campus, but we are also looking to education uh, in other levels. And for instance, we have been doing some work uh, with the vocational and secondary schools. So this is also very interesting because we can provide them with, with a specialized environment. So we, we, we launched this program uh, called the Fabulous Project and we attract these secondary schools. And uh, as you see, uh, the idea is to make them available uh, several workshops on, on, the, on the knowledge that is provided by the fabrication lab. And the goal is to integrate this digital manufacturing technology into their education, stimulate the so-called do-it-yourself, and we change, we challenge the people to have the, this idea. As you know, we would like to, they feel powerful and they can do almost everything. And we promote their working sh skills, but also the, provide more and more interaction with the students. And this is very important because these are uh, people that are, uh, sometimes they are in the terminal schools, they are very close to professionalization. And so they gave them uh, new skills. And finally, uh, I'd like to share with you another uh, uh, possibility. And uh, we have been also evolving the Erasmus program. And this is um, uh, uh, Erasmus devoted uh, for 3D printing support service for innovative citizens. And in this case, we have been launching this program to, to have literacy on 3D printing provided for librarians. So since we are a li library, we try to provide them with uh, comprehensive courses on 3D printings, uh, tools, uh, videos, methodologies, modules for use, all these activities. Actually, we launch uh, a very large inquiry to Europe, uh, to libraries, uh, how, how is the, the digital fabrication uh, is received by the libraries in Europe and it's still on, on uh, infancy. It's very, very in the beginning. Still, it's not yet uh, 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 knowledge that is integrated, but looks like most of the libraries are eager to have this kind of knowledge. So this was the, very briefly, was I would like to bring you these five examples, workshops, Fab Academy, uh, PhD program, and uh, interaction with schools and some projects for literacy. Finally, and I will finish, uh, this is just to acknowledge the people that are involved. We are a very small number of people involved. So uh, Anna and uh, two Annas, Anna Rocho and uh, Rosario, they are multiple, coming from the library. So they're very attentive to this kind of literacy and uh, um, uh, training uh, on these new technology. And Philippe Sylvester is really was one of our first students that got the Fab Academy. He has a diploma of material engineering science. He has make a master program and he's really the guy in, in charge of the operation of the Fab Lab. And um, uh, we like to see it as an open space for everybody to use them with their own ideas and creativity. And as uh, I think Luke was saying, it would be very important that in the future, uh, people from our Fab Lab will go not only online, but we'll visit and uh, the other fab labs that we are integrated in Europe because it's just uh, seeing eye by eye that we really, by contact eye, that we really can improve this kind of operations. And thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, we'll keep discussing through the, these workshops. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose. Just, just one clarification. So you are part, FCT Fab Lab is part of the library but the library belongs to the university, right? No, the, the library, yeah, is the, the university is a library, but it's sitting in the campus. Okay. It's sitting in the campus. So actually, it's called the FCT library, but actually it's an operation that involves a, a group of librarians in the new university. Yeah. Okay, so we have some some questions in the, in, in the chat. We will go back to them at the end. So I would like to continue uh with the program so uh now i'm going to Gianni. 
So, Gianni, do you want to share screen? Yes. And so the uh, yours. I think it's like this. No. You should have my screen. No, it opened a whiteboard, but. Um, Apparently, wow, uh, I can't share the whole screen. This is weird. Uh, let's start from here then. I've been having some problems with uh, Zoom lately. I don't know why, but sometimes it happens. Um, we can see so, your screen now, yeah. You can, nice, okay. Nice. I yeah. don't know why it opened the whiteboard and uh, let's see if I can. I can see the browser now. Good. No, I mean, the browser is on share, but I can't share the whole screen apparently. Uh, but well, <laughs> this is the, <laughs> anyway, let's start. This is a picture of our university. It's a, uh, in many fields, it's, the most northern university. And um, in the middle of Finland, just 200 kilometers from uh, Arctic Circle, uh, having 20,000 students or people inside and disciplines of medical sciences, biosciences, natural sciences, engineering, architecture. Uh, and pedagogic sciences, even am I forgetting something? <laughs> Let me well, know. I think most of it is there. Okay. And uh, the Fab Lab itself was started by, oh, let's see the Nordic part. I This is still in Oulu, showing the Northern Lights over the water. So, I'm hoping you might want to see this and visit us someday. <laughs> so the Fab Lab itself, I'm kind of curious, does anyone recognize her? She's pretty famous, at least in Finland. She's Linda Liukas, uh, who has been writing this uh, Ruby, uh, uh, educational book for children to start programming. So anyway, this is a picture of our lab. Uh, more or less, it looks like this. Usually more people, but you know how it is at the moment. And uh, we were started by the technical faculties, including architects. And we are part of the university itself. And as the program proceeded, Ivan mentioned this paper, uh, you can get the link. Uh, so Fab Academy started as, as a university program in which few people from Fab Lab Network sit, sat in, in Neil's class of how to, do, how to make almost anything. And it started from the university, it spread to the network and then we put it back to the university. Some of the uh, initiatives that were around when I started this paper with my colleagues have now ceased, but some of them are still active. And, and the methods are, as Ivan mentioned, quite different. So ours was to use Fab Academy as it is. And for that, I studied a uh, few years, Fab Academy students in my lab, and, and we calculated the hours and compared the background. We also compared to not only, only quantity, but quality of this education uh, compared to the university or higher level educations in several different ways. And, and in the end of the paper, we proposed this method to just make modules of this Fab Academy 
uh, subjects and have them as university courses. In our university, it's a policy to have aim all courses to five ECTS because of the students, uh, if they would work the whole spring and wouldn't graduate from Fab Academy, they would get none of the ECTS, even if they would have like 80% ready. So in this case, in smaller jumps, they can get ECTS, which is vital for the progress, motivation, and also funding, to be honest. So uh, I just want to briefly, so if you go to the Fab Academy site and, and take about, and then there's a link to this accreditations, uh, Ivan mentioned the ECTS, and in our case, it's 25. And it based, it's, it's based on the paper and the amount of work I saw the students to do. The, uh, I could have, I, I should have had more uh, study subjects, but there's only so many you have in, in Fab Academy. But anyway, so we, call, we ended up with 25 and it's really still one-to-one -to, -one to Fab Academy. There's nothing else, even in our university, we, we do teach a university version parallel to the Fab Academy, but a little bit on our own time frame. So we have two versions, we have Fab Academy and we have these university courses. And if you do the Fab Academy, you get accredited by the university, by these university courses. If you do university courses, you can get accredited by the Fab Academy. Uh, it hasn't been done yet, but it is possible and it won't cost as much as, as doing the Fab Academy as Fab Academy, because education is free in, in Finland. Then um, there was, let me see, there was Fab Lab Barcelona. I just wanted to point out, we had 25 ECTS. So as Ivan said, ECTS is European study credit point. It's um, it actually varies a little bit from the 27, depending on the field, 27 hours, but uh, more or less 27 hours. And uh, uh, while it says 45 in Fab Lab Barcelona, it doesn't mean it's one-to-one -to, -one to Fab Academy. It's uh, spread out and, and melted into their courses that are in altogether 45 ECTS. And Fab Academy is just, uh, they can use subjects from Fab Academy as part of the courses. And that's why the amount is so big. So it's a different approach. Uh, then, let me change this sharing to something else. So this is how we bundled the, co the courses. So, so basically, basically to, to do this Bologna process, um, ECTS, uh, we made these five, five uh, pieces of five ECTS courses and, and project management is having principles and practices, project management, uh, computer aided design, computer controlled cutting, and and inventors invention, intellectual property, and income. So, so this is kind of mandatory to get started because here is where you make your website and start your documentation and stuff like that. So we require usually students to take this course first and then continue. We have been very lenient on this, but we'll see when when the time goes that if we should maybe be more aggressively forcing this first course first. Then the electronic subjects are in one course, all of them. Uh, FAPLA programming, uh, having all the programming related subjects. And, and here you actually see the study objectives, what the student learns for all the course. This is for programming course, but all the courses have this. This is a document I actually provided for the university for them to agree have the, to have these as courses. 
And then what's in the course is, is told here. And um, evaluation is based on, on this um, Fab Academy assessment document. It's, it's again one-to-one -to, -one to that. That ensures that the goals and, and what the student learns and how it's evaluated is the same in Fab Academy as in our university courses. And then they can be uh, accredited both ways. So I'm using it one-to-one. -one. And then, then the last course is, is basically everything else that is not straightforward fitting to the other subjects. And, and finally, we have uh, the end project. So they do the machine part here to learn the teamwork and, and some soft skills that are actually in Fab Academy and more important than we usually realize. And that's about it. So I thought I would show briefly what, uh, what uh, courses look like. We have it in Moodle. Danny, just two more minutes because we want to move to the discussion. Yes. Thank you. Don't worry, I'm almost there. <laughs> so um, if I can find my Moodle page. Oh, here, sorry. So this is what, what the student sees. Uh, having these learning outcomes, exactly the same as in, in based on assessment document, uh, going to next page, course uh, introduction. Uh, the schedule is having similar things for Fab Academy, there is uh, feedback sessions here, just like in Fab Academy, uh, Neil asks students what you did, we have feedback sessions here, and they, we found these crucial for students to actually manage this course. First, we didn't have feedback sessions and they failed, but then we took this to action and, and then it started to work. And uh, then there's weekly subjects and they actually point, it says, sorry, it's not visible, but if you click the link, it goes actually to the Fab Academy site for the basic materials uh, from which we have uh, this quiz they have to fill before they come to class. And in class, we have this like uh, similar to, to local uh, instructor class for the subject and then they have uh, about one week to do their work. So it's very similar to, to Fab Academy. So they just uh, study it online partly instead of having this class from Neil. But they do actually watch the same classes. Uh, I think that's about it. And, and in panel, I'm sure I missed something, but in panel, you can ask questions. Thank you, Yanni, and thanks again to Jose and Luke for uh, providing their view on, on, on uh, or their experience on how digital fabrication has been integrated into their institutions. And now I would, I would like to move to a panel discussion. Um, actually, I have booked 30 minutes for this. I will make it in such a way that it's going to be 20 minutes where I, I had some um, topics that I would like to deal with. But after that, the last 10 minutes, I, I will give open to the audience. So we, we have already some questions in the, in, the, in the chat. We are going to answer those questions. And then if some of the people in the audience would like to make comments or, 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 or uh, perhaps some, um, write some questions, it, I will give uh, some time for that. So if we go to the uh, panel discussion, uh, we can uh, start with uh, uh, Jose, Luke and Gianni, why? Why do you think that digital fabrication should be integrated into higher education, university and vocational schools? So there is, as I, as I, I mentioned in the beginning, 
there is a lot of research going on on why STEAM is important uh, for uh, uh, students in comprehensive school, how it's helping kids to develop uh, additional skills apart from the, um, let's say, the, the specific knowledge of the different subjects. But why digital fabrication should be integrated into higher education? What kind of skills, what kind of uh, knowledge could provide to, to these students or considering that we are talking also about university researchers? So perhaps we are thinking of people who is already have finished their studies, but they need to learn some digital fabrication for their own research. So Jose, uh, Luke or Gianni, who want to start with this? I can start. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that there is a natural uh, curiosity about digital fabrication. So, uh, because digital fabrication, uh, in my my thoughts, I think brought a democ democratization of things that were available only in large scale, and they can be now done in small scale. And for instance, researchers and students, sometimes they have a special needs of a special apparatus or a tool, or they want to develop a small project, for instance, in terms of biology or mechanics or architecture, architecture and um, uh, so electronics. So there is so many small projects that can be developed so they can come to a, a space which uh, all these technologies are available and they can do something. So I think this kind of um, uh, availability uh, is important for, uh, for instance, in, in terms of uh, I education or uh, university campus. Uh, I see very, lots of people, my colleagues from chemistry, first they, they go there and to produce a small device for experimental uh, uh, tool they need uh, for a chromatography or for uh, some uh, electrophoresis or something like that, they came and use these technologies. And uh, I, I also see that most of departments nowadays, they, they are interested uh, in using the Fab Lab for, for very special knowledge. For instance, we launched our program with biomedicine for a school in Naval, and is for doing prothesis uh, for, for handicapped kids. Uh, so then we, we launched this program with them. And so we involve uh, people from medical grounds, we involve people from biomedicine. The Fab Lab is there. We have psycholo psychology, psych psychologues that are involved also on this operation. So I think what the Fab Lab makes is a unification of knowledge and different interdisciplinary knowledge that can be brought together. And, um, and uh, why do we want to integrate in AI education? Because we also have a need to have people trained uh, in this kind of uh, uh, overall experience because a uh, fab lab is, um, has so many things going on. It's not only the five pillars, which we talk all the time, the five pillars. And from those that are not uh, so specialized, we talk about uh, 3D plotting, uh, um, laser cut, vinyl cut, uh, um, um, well, all the operations that are going there, but uh, and we need someone that kind of integrate and can make a global overview of this kind of knowledge. And is why I think the Fab Lab integrated in higher education is important. We should have people trained in this kind of uh, knowledge. I think. Thanks, Jose. Uh, Johnny, so continue. Or... Yeah, please. <laughs> so uh, I kind of. Uh, uh, love this USS position in library and, and uh, the notion of digital literacy. Uh, I consider it as a human right. So, <laughs> so, so I, I believe it's, it's, uh, it's very important. And it's the change in, it's change of disruptive technologies in the society has been so rapid that it actually happens in all the levels of education at the same time. Uh, and and uh, for the, for the so, so the digital literacy is parting, starting in the elementary schools, but at the same time, we are working here at the university. And at the moment, if I look at the university point of view, uh, for instance, in our university, we used to have this workshop 
in which we had a professional uh, fine mechanics and, and people to do antennas and electronics and stuff like that. But it was all done manually. And the researcher just went there with the idea and they worked together to make it happen. But it's very expensive. And now our researchers are learning how to use these digital designing and fabrication processes. So they learn to design by fabricating something. So they know what works and what doesn't. And, and then they can actually draw the things they need in the, in the research and then just order them. And our university is closing that workshop and it's been getting smaller and smaller all the time. So our researchers really do need these skills. Look, yeah, um, I think really it's important to, to be able to, to build your own tools and I, I can develop that for agriculture because really um, it's uh, modifying totally the way agriculture is done. Like, uh, for instance, you have to buy a tractor for, uh, from a, an industrial and those are bigger, huge each year a bigger tractor and it, it really um, changed the way you do agriculture. Um, so by um, uh, be able to, to, to build your own tools, you can try really different way of, um, of testing agriculture because it's not, uh, you need to do real tests for agriculture. It's a long scale, uh, like one year to, to grow crops and, for instance, here, uh, one member build um, his own tools and you can change the, the size between uh, each vegetable. If you buy it from an industrial, it will say, okay, for this kind of, uh, I, don't say, I don't know, like potatoes, it will be uh, 40 centimeters, for example. But with this kind of tool, you can decide yourself and try different techniques. So this is really, um, some kind of bottom-up uh, really ID. Like you, you, you don't, you, you can choose and try yourself stuff. And uh, like this year we had a student that built uh, with Fab Academy his own small robot. And that's totally the opposite of what most uh, agriculture do. Like it's really thinking about different model with small device. So it's not like most of the, the, the trends of bigger, huger stuff. It's like um, to be able to have smaller tools for smaller lands. And that also farmer were used to, to repair themselves, their own device. And nowadays a, a tractor is like a, a, a real computer and nobody can anymore uh, repair it. So by thinking really differently the tools, you are able to take back a knowledge, experiment with it. And that's really, uh, I think, uh, an important tools uh, to have to, to be able to, to prototype and test a theoretical model with real situation. So basically, uh, what we have is a practical approach. So both researchers and, and students, they will have to build something by themselves. So it's important to have this digital fabrication knowledge. It will save cost and it will save time for, for all of us. That's great. But when we are talking about this uh, digital fabrication, uh, the main examples that we have seen here are basically either science. Uh, Jose has been talking about chemistry, for instance, biology or um, um, or engineering. But my question is, uh, would this digital fabrication be important for other fields, humanities? Jose mentioned about uh, this multidisciplinarity. How can we bring, uh, or is it useful, or is, uh, let's say, it's going to be useful for humanities, for instance, to, to learn uh, on this digital fabrication? Do you have any? Ideas on this? Yeah, if I if I can add, I, I'll take what the Yanni was saying. Um, uh, libraries are, are democratic uh, spaces, 
as you say, and digital fabrication can be integrated. Uh, we call ourselves in the library, a library beyond the books. So it's, uh, the books are important. We do our job as a library uh, in a different way nowadays. But for instance, we do lots of art exhibitions in the library. We do music, we do theater, we do movies and so on in the library. And so addition of a fab lab there brings another dimension to this kind of multicultural program. Uh, we should not forget that we are facing 8,000 students from engineering. And sometimes the, the teaching is very narrow in kinds of, uh, of uh, disciplines and what the knowledge. And people must be humanized, I say. They must be faced with other subjects, other important, important things like art and music, uh, all these things. And, and I, I was very surprised, but yesterday I was reading in the newspaper, uh, a very important school uh, in, in Lisbon, uh, it's not our school, another competi competi competitive school in engineering. They just launched also programs that, where they, they will put engineering students uh, facing uh, psychology and uh, art and uh, uh, history. Uh, other topics uh, to enrich their own background. And it's what we have been doing for a few years now in our campus. We have been trying to bring this kind of activity. So in terms of attracting other publics from more humanities, uh, it is not difficult. For instance, uh, we have artists that came to the lab to use 3D printing for doing, for instance, um, uh, engraving. Engraving, engraving, as you know, for instance, uh, Schilogervur, they do things in wood and they do with, uh, they carve there and they print papers to do multiple copies and so on. So they can do the same thing with a 3D plotter or with, with a, a laser cut, they can do that. And we even have exhibitions in the library of artists using the, 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 the tools on the Fab Lab to produce uh, art artwork. For instance, uh, people from architecture, they do, first they do with drones, first they can do images from the high uh, of, of a square of a building and so on. And so the, the, then they digitalize this kind of information get from a drone, a sky view, and they produce printing in 3D printing uh, by, by these models for the maquettes and so on and so on. Uh, and so there are there, there is diff different tools we can use and, and, the, and the, the grounds in medicine is very large. We, we also work in museums. For instance, um, I'll tell a little story, but there's a, a tropical museum in Portugal. They, since we, a long time ago, we had colonies and so on. And they have uh, diseases from Africa where they affect faces and from people and so on. Uh, and so what we have done, we digitalize this kind of material they have there. Uh, and make small models, and now this can be touched by in visuals, people that cannot see. So for inclusivity, also we can use this kind of tools to improve the, the interaction of museums with people that cannot easy access. So I think we have a very wide range of applications we can use and we can attract people. Thanks, Jose. Any thoughts upon Jose ideas? Yeah, um, from my point of view, uh, I have a background in engineering, but we do have to remember why engineers engineer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so why would anyone do anything unless it's somehow for uh, humans and people? Okay. So engineer designs something, it's either for himself or herself or someone else, or it touches someone else somehow. Uh, humanities are really important, uh, not only as, a, as, as why we do things, and it's basically our motivation, but it's important for Fab Labs. Uh, it's very important to have a diverse user base, because that's where the innovations happen. And in, in my Fab Lab, since we opened the doors every Monday as, as, as a Fab Lab suit, uh, this is the first dysfunctional innovative uh, space that I have ever seen. This is absolutely the best so far. <laughs> so, so, so the A in this team really is important to be us all together. Thank um, you. I don't know if I can add something. So perhaps it's better if we continue and then uh, I can give you the in when we finish this panel, I can give you the uh, the word in five five minutes time. Okay.
Okay. For, for me, uh, another really important stuff is um, also the, the change of status of knowledge and teaching. And um, also, I would just react before continuing with uh, Iani. Yeah, really, the, the mixing of different backgrounds is really important. And that, that's where we are really happy with our uh, regional gathering because we, we are more in a engineering uh, system. So th that makes some kind of mental uh, way of thinking. And by exchanging with artists or researcher, we really opened the, the way of thinking for, for our students. So that's really something really important, I think. Uh, another stuff about the, 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 the status of knowledge. So really an important part in, in Fab Academy and that's different in France from classical university. It's really the, the, um, the acceptance of failure. Failure is a major uh, element when you learn. And in Fab Academy, you have to describe how you fail. And wh when I was a student, uh, I learned different language. And it was also this, always when you do mistake, it was, it's bad, don't do again, this kind of mistake. And here, it's more like you learn from other mistakes. That's really different. And that's something that, that, that was lost in a way uh, in education. And the other part about the status is really like, I'm, for example, instructor here, but I'm sure students can uh, teach to other people a lot of what they are knowing, because maybe one of them is expert in cooking a, a certain stuff, and it can really uh, be beneficial for other. Like, it's really the idea of a peer-to-peer teaching and learning. So that could be physically here between the, the, the students. And then with the system of Fab Academy, we, we go to a more um, virtual way by doing it regionally. So we, we have exchange with a, a wider community. And then there is this idea of really the international um, community where we, we can teach and learn from each other because we have so many experts. And really it's, it's not like um, a competition about diploma. So somebody without a high diploma can really give also good ideas. And th that's really a major change uh, in my point of view of learning and teaching in university also. Okay, thank you, Luke. And now, uh, before uh, opening the mic to the to the audience, I would like to uh, go a little bit more practical. And I guess that from the audience, we will have people that would would like to to create something similar to what you have done in your institution. So, what kind of first of all, what kind of challenge have you faced? What was the most important challenge that you have faced when uh, trying to integrate this uh, digital fabrication knowledge into, into your institution? And then what uh, kind of advice would you give to someone who would like to, to, to do something similar to what you have done? So perhaps we can start with, before it was Jose, so perhaps Gianni can start now. Okay. Um... In my case, again, the community brought in the power. Uh, I wrote a paper and kind of uh, opened the door, but it was my students who actually made it happen, to be honest. So my students doing FAP Academy went to different professors saying that we need to uh, get the study credit points. And at some point, the professors actually contacted me and asked, how we would make this easier instead of uh, accrediting these separately. We, before this, these uh, courses, we accredited, accredited those separately and the results were different in different faculties. But after the paper and after, after contact some of, of, of some professors, after my students contacted them, then we just opened these courses and, and we made it happen. And it, after, support from the suitable parties it only took some papers to 
fill to fill the bureaucracy needs and and it was done uh, so we have the courses but they are not in the study uh, structures yet courses are available and students can use them as part of their studies but they are not visible as as a uh, say minor in in some education and that's what we are actually working on right now thanks Yanni. Uh, jose yeah <clears throat> well there is a, a basic question is the funding before put together fab lab uh, in our case uh, was uh, not well, we had the opportunity uh, to have funding from uh, the american embassy in portugal because we belong to there are six libraries in portugal they belong to what is called the american corners is really exchange of programs, uh, scientific and cultural programs involving the culture, uh, United States and Portugal. And through that, we could launch uh, uh, the basics for, for putting together the five pillars of, of the Fab Lab. And uh, if we have this, it's not a big, big investment, but it's something you have to have. And a part of that, I think, is required for absolutely required to have someone that uh, will take care of the Fab Lab. So someone that has already some knowledge about the Fab Lab that can, can. although although this is an open space, as um, um, Yannick was saying, you have this beautiful experience of uh, the lab running by itself <laughs> and repairing itself, <laughs> which is fantastic. But I think in our case, it would be difficult <laughs> to have this exactly the same situation. But even so, to have someone that, that uh, gives a little help, a little help for my friend that is sitting there that gives some lights how to do this how to do that but we encourage a lot of people to come to our workshops i think this is i think the way they can be motivated to learn the basics because if they don't know the basics so for instance for 3d they have this a basic advanced course for laser cut there is also basic advanced advanced courses and they are free in general they are free unless they involve a lot of material for instance like arduins or or this kind of kit that i told you before but in general they are free and they 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 can um, i said incentivate the curiosity for these technologies and then they came back to the fab lab to produce something or scientific for instance they can do a model from some material science or they can do uh, orbitals for chemistry or they can do visiting cards if they want uh, if they want to do that or something uh, there's some uh, very large applications they can do and as Luke was saying and think is important this is the space where people meet and unfortunately we are not at the stage now because of the pandemic we may miss that to have people there uh, interacting but I think very soon we'll come back to uh, normality but um, if people are there they exchange the what they are doing there is a what are you doing how you do this how you do that 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 is very important this exchange in terms of, um, I think the Fab Lab once is operating, they must do a lot of publicity. I think they have to to get out of their cage and uh, do publicity and uh, see what they they are they are doing uh, through the workshop. I think workshops are very important for that. For that too. But we also can go a lot of things like fairs, markets, market fairs, and uh, uh, schools and so on to. To, to improve the publicity of what, what's going on, I think it's important. In terms of Fab Academy, Fab Academy is very important, but it's expensive and is very time, um, not consuming time uh, user uh, for 16 weeks, very intensive. So uh, that is important for those that are really want to have a very global knowledge for the operation of Fab Lab. And sometimes they have the chance to get a job uh, on this kind of thing. It's not very easy. It's not very easy. I don't think it's very easy. But some of them, for they are going to manufacturing of glass industry, of these huge kind of supermarkets of Aldi's and uh, and um, uh, Le Roi Merlin and, and this kind of thing. So sometimes they, they, they have a way out to all these things, but, but it's not easy. But it's very enriching. If someone can do it, uh, it's, it's an experience. It's very, very... Uh, experience so in a certain way what we'd like to have in the campus is to 
not oblige people to go through the Fab Academy, but to have an operation uh, through the Fab Lab where we can have a master or a PhD program and using the, the knowledge that they are sitting in the departments, departments that already knowledge and they can be used to teach classes. So uh, it was the idea to use the departments. And so I, I see the if we manage to have a PhD program will be something kind of a, uh, an umbrella uh, for different departments. So it's not be just controlled by one department, everything is five or six departments uh contributing to the development of the program but um, i think it's worthwhile to have these experiences it's worthwhile thanks jose for your thoughts uh look any advice yeah for, in, in our case we will really start with a workshop and to, to do example of real prototype in in uh, in real condition, so we convince a lot of people that in one or two weeks it, it was possible to, to build stuff. So it really opened mind of a lot of people. And another argument was that um, MIT name is some kind of uh, it give a strong picture to um, some uh, so in an academic way it's something some kind of a brand. So it, it was also powerful to. To, to say this is a kind of lessons that come from uh, MIT program, so that that helps a lot. And uh, another specific stuff for us was um, Unilia Sal is historically a, a part of and creator of what was called the Lasallian network. So it's really a, an old uh, system of new pedagogical way of teaching. And it, it's also a worldwide network. So this is really related to the way of Fab Academy work. So with new way of teaching with this distributed uh, system and by uh, doing by learning. So it's really common. And this idea of a worldwide network. So those were really common ideas to, to, to the the roots of the university here. So that was really easier to, to put in place. OK, thank you very much for your uh, thoughts. Actually, we don't have, I have many things to ask, but we don't have that much time. Actually, one of the topics that I would have liked to cover it a little bit more is the challenge that you have had with your institution. If you have had some discussion, I guess that you have some issues with them, but we can we can cover this at some other time. And I would like to open the time for the audience. I would like to book uh, the following 10 minutes uh, for the audience. I think that we have some questions from FabLab Winam or some uh, uh, ideas he wanted to comment. Yes, th thank you. Um... I just wanted to comment the, when there was a discussion about uh, digital fabrication to benefit the humanities. I strongly think that it, it does because uh, personally I am a social worker and I moved to, to Fab Labs because I, I was thinking that uh, we can help solve some social problems through making things. And basically digital fabrication is giving people opportunity to make things. So you will find different people who wants to, uh, let's say different people learning humanities, they end up in their field of what they do. They have things that they want to make. And normally they think of, can I tell somebody to make it for me? And now you are giving them opportunity of, can they participate in making them themselves? So this one is even giving them more powers into their hands to, to do their work. And I have given example of a case of a counselor doing child counseling and they need some specific toys to help in counseling in a given way. So they can easily design that kind of toy and 3D print it to make sure that their end goal is met well. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I don't know if you want to make some uh, additional comments, Jose Yanni, or look. Otherwise, we can move to the next question we have. Uh, from William, I think you have a few questions there. So you can take the mic, the mic sorry, if you want. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, Yanni, you mentioned the, uh, I think it was just you or the others as well, perhaps the, the 
the idea of working, offering your own courses, your own university courses alongside uh, or in parallel to the Fab Academy courses. So you, you teach them yourself versus what Neil does. And then you said something about being able to credit going both ways so that uh, anybody who take your courses could get the Fab Academy diploma and obviously vice versa. Um, that strikes me as being a little detrimental to the Fab Foundation's financial model. What, how did that go? I mean, how, have you finished that arrangement or, or what, what came of that? So basically at the moment, if someone takes the Fab Academy and is my student or our university student, uh, then he or she can get it accredited. So basically if you do the Fab Academy in my at least if you do the Fab Academy in my, my lab and, and uh, are our student, it goes easily. If you do it somewhere else and come to study with us, then we do have to review the work. Uh, the other way, uh, it doesn't break the funding model because what you do is you only pay for the global evaluation and having the pages up and getting the diploma. So you don't pay that $5,000 or euros. Uh, I don't actually know the sum, but uh, it can be done. All right, I just, just occurs because we have the same problem here with there's no tuition fees in Germany. So it's unusual for anyone to spend large amounts of money to get credit for anything. So that's why I was curious as to how your, your arrangement with the Fab Foundation uh, had gone. Thanks yeah, actually working to get it a bit further, but I'm not sure if we can manage that. We are trying to get Fab Academy uh, to be certified by subject. Then we could actually have it even more easily because it wouldn't have the time constraint of one year as it does now. Right. But it's it it's it's having a, some some resistance at the moment. But we are I'm having a pilot with uh, with a person from. Denmark, and we'll see how it goes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Gianni. Thank you, William. Now we had another question from City, City Asthma. So if you want to ask the question yourself, it was a question for Jose. City, are you there? Well, hi. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm here, but I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm not comfortable with my appearance at the moment to on my camera. I hope no you guys problem. are fine with that. Um, yeah, um, actually, my question um, is for Jose. Uh, it's about the, uh, the, the, the fablet that he has in the library setting, right? So my question is, we have problems in my country. I don't think any in my library in my country or the have a tablet or um, because the librarians still are not um, are not moving forward with their um, what what is it is their, their, their administration work so um, they are also curious when I, I also have a, a like a maker space in a library but I can't even involve any of the librarian staff into my maker space because they seem they don't want to involve because they think it's kind of weird, you know? Okay, so the question here, how actually your place train the librarian that involved in your fab lab? Does it have to be like all of them um, being trained in all the skill, like 3D printing, one of you is Arduino, one of you are electronic, or all, all of them um, you train to be good at it. So it's easier to, in order to assist the users that come to the fab lab. That's uh, this is my question. Thank you very much. Okay, City. Thank you very much for your question. Where where are you from? I'm from Malaysia. Okay, okay. So um, let's see. The, um, when we launched this, this uh, Erasmus program, uh, this is coordinated by the Irish people in Limerick, and uh, we are involving uh, six or seven countries in Europe. And the idea was to bring about this uh, 3D printing experience to library. Uh, as I explained a little bit before, uh, to have this kind of a seat in a library is quite natural. I think you can convince people that uh, uh, libraries are the ideal 
space to develop this kind of tools. But um, answering to your question, we are not training everybody in the library. So at this moment, uh, the people that are involved in the project, they attend these meetings. And so they, they have been learning about the module developments and so on. They contribute also to a lot of inquiries to know the state of art of 3D printing in Europe. And um, so some part of the staff is training. Uh, so I'll tell you, we have about 25 people in working in the library. Only five are involved in this kind of uh, development for 3D printing. And they are not uh, learning all the other pillars uh, for the Fab Lab so far. So this is really devoted to 3D printing. But um, it's experience and uh, they, they accept quite well. And, uh, and so they will assist in the future all these machines that are in the Fab Lab and in the library, they will assist to the functioning of um, uh, and operation of, of the machines that are available for students. Thank okay. you, Jose. Yep. Okay, so, thank you very much for that answer. You uh, always, always can contact us if you'd like. I'll yeah, read it. I really hope I'll talk at you personally. I'll give you my, my, email, my email in the chat, okay? Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Okay, so unfortunately now I need to, we need to leave. I have an important meeting going on uh, right now. Uh, I can keep this open anyhow, if, if you want to continue the, the, the discussion, Luke and Jose perhaps can stay for another five minutes, but just wrapping up, uh, we have been discussing about the importance of having um, digital fabrication in higher education. Uh, we were discussing about the importance of uh, multidisciplinarity. So it's not only for, uh, let's say, more scientific or, or more engineering courses, but uh, anyone in the community, in the higher education community can benefit from it. Actually, Janice said that uh, multidisciplinarity is where innovation happens. And then uh, Jose was mentioning about peer-to-peer -peer teacher. Uh, and uh, creating, sorry, it was Luke who mentioned about this peer-to-peer -peer network of, of, of different uh, experts. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis in what uh, Gianni, Jose, and Luke have mentioned on, on the utility of the follow-up as, as the place to build things. So things that you don't need to buy things anymore, but if you are in a hurry, uh, you need to build some device. You can build a device for your own research or for your own studies. Um, the importance when, when we are talking about uh, creating this uh, or try to integrate digital fabrication on involving the community. So for example, Jose emphasized the importance of uh, organizing works on for students or for researchers. So they learn the basics. Johnny uh, mentioned that when these students, they learn about Fab Academy, they uh, went through our courses, they were asking uh, the the university to integrate this into into their curriculum. So how can we get credits? So it's important to start, even if the if, if the organization initially doesn't support that much the idea to uh, work with the community. And uh, Jose mentioned also the use of uh, knowledge from uh, different departments. So it's not only. Uh, um, let's say try not to have only one department involved, but try to involve multiple um, um, departments, uh, uh, multiple disciplinary dis disciplines in the in the. Um, uh, if you want to integrate this digital fabrication, and then Luke mentioned that uh, I think this is a matter of marketing. If you mentioned MIT. Uh, some of your doors can be open okay so thank you everybody uh, for being there thank you all the audience and thank you all the speakers especially Gianni, uh, jose and look for for your interest in discussion i'm have to leave now uh, but i don't know if jose and luke can stay for another five minutes just in case uh, some people from the from the audience wants to uh, 
ask some questions. And remember, if you want to join the community, just send me an email. I can write my email. Sorry. Uh, I'm writing my email in the chat. And you can send me an email and I can send you instructions on how to join the community, how to join these uh, weekly meetings and how you are, can access and contribute to the documentation that we are generating. So thank you very much for your uh, being here and I hope it has been interesting for you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.